You are listening to Arcane Carolinas, an exploration of the Carolinas' folklore, legends, myths, and modern weird. Each episode, we examine the historical context of our topic and aim to preserve some of the stories that help make this part of the world such a fascinating place. Welcome to another episode of Arcane Carolinas as part of our Fall 2020 Blitz. I'm award-winning novelist Michael G. Williams, who writes many, many books about many different things, a lot of which are set in North Carolina. I'm Charlie Mushaw, and I'm happy to be here. (laughs) I'm also happy to be here. I just like your money. (laughs) Today we are joined by our Hatteras correspondent in the field, Joe Bird. Hey guys, how are you? Doing well, how are you? Good, 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 good. Joe actually brought us today's story, which is out of Dare County. Dare County is the easternmost county in North Carolina. It was formed from three different counties in 1870, which is kind of a trend that we're noticing. Mm -hmm. So Currituck, Tyrell, and Hyde counties were combined in 1870 to form Dare. It's named in honor of Virginia Dare, the first English child born in America. The county contains Roanoke Island, much of the Outer Banks, and approximately 85 miles of continuous coastline. It was originally inhabited by Native Americans of the Croatoan or Hatteras tribe, and the first English attempts to establish a colony in the New World took place on Roanoke Islands in the 1580s. Uh, it was the site of several failed attempts by the English, the last and largest of which being the Lost Colony of wow. 1587. So they just kept throwing stuff at the wall to see what would stick and nothing stuck. <laughs> Unfortunately for everyone involved, what they were throwing at the wall were people. Uh, <laughs> Even in the 1500s? <laughs> <laughs> You'd think they'd learn their lesson. Send another boat. Well, what happened to the last one? We don't know. Just send another one. <laughs> <laughs> In a previous episode, we talked about how Spanish conquistadors made it as far west and as and north as central Tennessee, eastern Tennessee, and western North Carolina until the local Native Americans got sick of the abuse and decided to run them all out and kill the ones who wouldn't get run out. And I'm just like, yeah, that's how you get it done. And then the Spanish learned their lesson. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, eventually, the English were able to settle in the region, but the population remained pretty small throughout the 18th century. Famous things from Dare County, Orville and Wilbur Wright had their famous first flight at what is now known as Kill Devil Hills, which I did a report on in the second grade. No way. Yep. Newspapers mistakenly reported that the flight took place at Kitty Hawk because that's where the telegram home came from. Ah, okay. It's home to an abandoned town called Buffalo City, which was a big bootlegging town during Prohibition. Was it a formal town or was it a place where a bunch of people did bootlegging? No, no, it was a formal town. It was a logging town. And then Prohibition hit and they realized, hey, you know, all that moonshine we know how to make, we can base our economy on that instead. And that's what they did. And then when Prohibition fell off, they tried to go back to logging and it didn't really work out. And the town just kind of was abandoned in the 50s, I believe. Okay. There's an old rusty rail line there and some rubble where buildings once stood. Hmm. Interesting. There's also Portsmouth Island. That might be Tyrell County, technically, or what is now Tyrell County. But it's an island south of Hatteras, kind of. So you got Hatteras and Ocracoke, and it's kind of just out there. And there's still buildings and stuff there. You can do four by four tours. You got to take a crazy, sketchy boat right over. And four by fours. And the mosquitoes, you, I hear the mosquitoes are like the size of a baseball. Do you mean to tell me that there's abandoned towns on barrier islands that are constantly slammed by hurricanes? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> in theory. <laughs> Why wouldn't anyone want to live there? Sorry, that sounds really <laughs> disparaging. I've never personally been, but I hear it's beautiful. Joe tells me it's beautiful, and I believe him. I ran a half marathon in Kill Devil Hills in Kitty Hawk one year, and it was really, really fun, really great. Nice, flat terrain. <laughs> good for a run right yeah it was really awesome and it's the only half marathon i've ever run where locals set up tables to do shots of beer as you ran past sounds about right gotta carb up Mm -hmm. speaking of joe as the local expert do you have any businesses or establishments that you want to plug from dare county sure so my one of my favorite places to eat when i go down to hatteras is cat's deli it's in the north end of hatteras village at the stove on 12 cat makes awesome sandwiches they're always really punny names so my (laughs) favorite is the onion tended consequences (laughs) sandwich with avocado and a bacon onion jam (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, it's nice it's low-key she has beers which 
which is great for lunch when you're on vacation. Catch or whenever. Food, or just whenever. <laughs> but it's excusable on vacation. <laughs> I, I think I've told you the story, Joe. Michael, I don't know if I've told you the story. This was a couple of years ago. I went on vacation to one of those all-inclusive places, and they were just constantly handing you food and beverage, right? So I was there for a week and came back, and I remember it was like the first day back, and I didn't have to work. It was like a Monday or whatever. It was like my decompression day. And I wake up, and I eat my cereal, whatever, go about my business. Like an hour later, I open the fridge to get something to drink, and I start reaching for a beer, and it's like 11 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, wait, no, you are not on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> It's <laughs> kind of funny. The the things that we let ourselves do on vacation that become normal. And then when you come back to reality, you're like, oh, wait, no, that's not acceptable. <laughs> vacation is a spirit you can carry in your heart year round if you really work at it. <laughs> vacation can be anywhere if you believe. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and a local Dare County business that I would like to plug is Nags Head Pizza Company. Nice. Yeah, they're really great, and they're owned by some friends. That's awesome. So this story is kind of fun because, Joe, you actually found it because of a business in Dare County. I did. The same business I just promoted, Cat's Deli. So we were down there, I don't know, was it June? No, July, right around 4th of July. Went to go grab sandwiches to bring back to the cottage and figured to grab a couple beers while we're at it. And I always like to drink local anywhere I am. So I grabbed a couple beers from Lost Colony Brewery. She had in her little case there. And I tend to like browns and reds. So I pick up something called Hatteras Irish Red. Go back to the cottage. We're sitting out on the porch eating our sandwiches. And, you know, I always, always like to read my cans as well. And it starts talking about the Hatteras. You're an informed consumer. I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> so it starts talking about the heteris witch, which, 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 which I remember after I'm reading it, I've heard the story before, but it never like sunk in. I never like paid any attention to it. So I start reading the story on the can and then do a little bit more research. And within an hour, I'm in the car going looking for the tree that's in the story. So I found it pretty easily. And I had never heard this story. So I learned about it from you who learned about it from Lost Colony Brewery. How was the beer? Oh, fantastic. It's a a nice session red. Uh, So it's like an Irish red. I think like Killian's, but a little bit lighter. Um, It's fairly light. Really good. Sweet. And I had never heard it. You brought it to me. I'm like, hey, you should talk about this. And I was like, you should talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and Michael, had you heard it before? No, never heard of it before in my life. So we are going to talk about the Cora tree. It has appeared on all the cable networks that you would imagine, Travel Channel, the shows that are like, you know, Cases of the Unknown. It's mm-hmm. been on Lore, which is a popular podcast that actually has yeah. They had a TV show for a little while, apparently, too. It's on a couple of blogs. It is on a homeowners association website. Uh, (laughs) So it's pretty widespread, this legend. And I was kind of surprised that I hadn't heard it. I tried to track down the origins of it like we do, dig through names and try to find some records. And it seems to definitively have been told for the first time in publication by Charles Wedby in his fifth book, of Outer Banks Legends and Lore. Wow. Titled Blackbeard's Cup and Stories of the Outer Banks. So I found Chuckles Wedby's book on eBay (laughs) (laughs) for the low, low price of like two bucks. I was like, all right, let me look at the source material because all the blogs and websites that cover this story are pretty consistent, but I wanted to go back to the first published version that I could find. And so that's what I'm I'm not going to read it straight through because it is kind of lengthy as far as these things go, but we'll do the nickel version here and I'll pull details from the book. Basically on this island, there exists a, a tree, a gigantic tree, a gigantic live oak, which botanists estimate must be a thousand years old. This is the opening line. So there's this tree and burned into the side are the letters C-O-R-A or Cora. The legend goes that a witch was tied to this tree to be killed and in an explosion, she disappeared while tied to the tree and all that was left behind was her initials burned in and nobody knows what happened to her. My first reaction to this is good for her. (laughs) Well... <laughs> That's the nickel version, right? Sure. So the the detailed version is there was this fishing village and in the woods lived a woman named Cora that always had a baby with her. Generally went about her business. People just said, "Oh, that's Cora the witch." She was said to have touched a cow 
and it stopped giving milk. One of the reasons that she was known to be a witch also that when fishing was lean, she always somehow seemed to have a full supply of fish and food. So Mm -hmm. even though the village was struggling, she'd be doing all right. Mm. So she was better at living there than everyone else. (laughs) (laughs) And at some point, Captain Eli Blood of the ship Susan G out of Massachusetts. Wow. A fitting name. Wrecked and had to take shelter in this town. This is a detail that gets left out of a lot of the stories. Captain Eli Blood was a self-proclaimed white witch and witch hunter out of Massachusetts. I feel like self-proclaimed is an important part of that. (laughs) Like, like he probably said that part quietly. Like, he would be like, I'm a self-proclaimed, you know, etc. Right. Dude shows up on the island and is observing the local culture. While he's there, a dead body washes up on shore, belongs to a local young man. His hands were clasped in the attitude of supplication. And they did like praying, I think. Yeah. (laughs) Or begging. Yeah. The digit 666 were burned into his forehead and small footprints like those of a woman were found leading away from the body and into the local woods. Probably listening to that rock music. (laughs) (laughs) That or a little Johnny Cash. (laughs) (laughs) You know the kids those days? He rolled long hair and their Satanism. Rolled a natural one and look what happened. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say, actually, Captain Eli Blood is like the D&Dist name. I've ever heard. Like, if somebody walked into a D&D game and said, oh, I'm going to play Captain Eli Blood, Witch Hunter, that would get kicked out in a heartbeat. <laughs> it's kind of cheeseball, right? So, Honestly, I'm just like, no wonder the people who lived there failed at living there. <laughs> so I mentioned I mentioned that she was always carrying around a baby, right? Yeah. So it was always a baby. Right. Didn't All, age. Didn't age. It was always a baby. A little boy mocked the baby. And got sick and died. It's a life lesson right there. (laughs) Don't make fun of people. (laughs) You're not dissuading me from Team Cora here. So these events were said to have set Captain Blood's resolution on fire. And he was like, that's it. I'm getting this witch. I have a question. How? What's the duration here that she was on the island and everyone said she was a witch but left her alone? We are going to get into just how squishy the details are on this legend. Got it. Got it. And one of my thoughts was like, how long was this baby suspiciously just a baby? Like, are we like talking about months. three weeks or are we talking about like 30 years? Right. <laughs> and had these people never seen dolls or did they also think dolls were signs of Satan? Well, maybe it was, maybe it was uh, like Baby Herman from Roger Rabbit. <laughs> yeah exactly you know i think that was his name right baby herman <laughs> i don't remember it is now that, um, that's what we're going with <laughs> great character fantastic character so he goes and he tracks down cora and drags her out and begins the process uh the extremely scientific process of determining whether one is a witch or not yeah uh, you know, involving does she weigh more than a duck etc all right attempted to cut her hair but failed because the hair was tougher than wire rope I just want to note that my extended silence is filled with expressions of disbelief. He chucked her in some water to see if she would float, that kind of thing. Oh, my God. He was supposed to be from Massachusetts. You know that's <laughs> what they do. I mean, it's the best well, test in the world. You sink, you're dead. Doesn't matter if you're a witch or not. If you float, you live. You have to be a witch, right? Yeah. Right. So Far be it for me to impugn the culture of the people of Massachusetts, but no. She floats back or whatever to the shore. They do this weird ritual where all of his sailors, like his crew members from his ship, prick their fingers and put droplets of blood into a bowl of water, which is then whipped until it's frothed. And then he reads the liquid, which said, Cora's a witch. And also... This dude needs to invest in better alphabet soup. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) My least favorite Campbell's condensed soup. (laughs) Witchy blood bubbles. (laughs) And in the bowl of liquid, the reflection showed the devil himself standing behind her. Mm. Which I would like to again mention, this is very far from the devil's tramping ground. Yeah, he's done some walking. He's opportunistic. I got to get back. Uh, Listen, (laughs) Southern Supreme closes by five and I need to pick up a fruitcake on the way back down. So if you could just- dry cleaning. Yeah, the dry cleaning, it's a whole thing. So if we could just do the blood bowl and I could be on my way, that'd be cool. 
I've only got a few minutes here, people. <laughs> All right, let's get those blood bubbles going. Do you feel like now we know how Captain Blood got the name Captain Blood, though? <laughs> I feel like his name was probably something like Captain Smith. And then eventually he did this enough times and people were like, okay, listen, dude, we are changing your name. There was a Captain Tom in this story who was the local sort of patriarch. I omitted him because he doesn't do anything other than be the everyman in this story. He's just like, (laughs) like Captain Blood shows up and just runs Tom's game. Yeah, the the story I hear is Captain Tom tries to stop everything. He's like, no, we're not doing this. This is crazy talk. We're going to put her through normal due process. Yeah. Captain Blood said, hell no. (laughs) But he's worthless. He's like, this is a family-friendly podcast, and you can subscribe to our Patreon to hear me call him a... (laughs) (laughs) all right now the non-patreon version this incredibly weak man who is run all over by the stranger from out of town contributes contributes nothing to the story he allows the residents of his village to be dunked in the water hair attempted to be cut accused of witchcraft and almost executed (laughs) because (laughs) i feel like this guy is a character out of like any number of different tv shows he's the mayor of the local town of the week from like a million (laughs) different episodes of xena star trek whatever he's just like waiting for the crew of the enterprise or hercules or somebody to show up and teach him a very valuable lesson about leadership Mm -hmm. except they got the wrong guy to do it I'm imagining the bumbling post-colonial mayor of a Spanish town in Zorro or something. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. I'm in charge here. Are you? (laughs) I don't think you are. Yeah. Maybe, maybe telling that to the angry mob that are all pricking their fingers, bleeding into a bowl, and telling you they see the devil in it. <laughs> I see it. <laughs> maybe he just had too many Irish reds, and he was just <laughs> hanging out. <laughs> maybe. So Captain Tom is worthless. Captain Blood has a stupid name. Cora is tied to a tree. Captain Blood's like, "That's it. We're burning her." Oh, they're also killing the baby. <laughs> like it's a baby witch. In this story, she's still holding the baby. So this is where the theatrics continue in this story. Up until that moment, the day had been a beautiful one with a clear sky and brilliant sunlight. Suddenly, there boiled in from the sound of one of the biggest and blackest clouds ever seen in those often stormy parts. The dark blanket of clouds spread over the sky like black ink poured into a pan of white milk. Little getting kind of purple in your prose here. The onlookers stared in disbelief. A huge clap of thunder sounded, and out of the black cloud bank, there flashed a blinding bolt of lightning. It struck the live oak near the crown of the tree. The bolt split the already ancient forest giant from top to bottom. There was the strong smell of sulfur and brimstone, and the whole group, crewmen, blood, and Smith, and the islanders fell to their knees, blinded, choking for breath on a cloud of smoke. Good for her. Oh, we're not done. Okay. When the smoke cleared, there was no sign of Cora. The ropes were there around the tree and the dry kindling still piled untouched. But no Cora. No sign except for the split tree and the four distinct letters of C-O-R-A freshly burned deep into the heart of the tree. Wait, what's that you say? What about the baby? The baby apparently (laughs) looked at them, looked at the villagers, turned into an evil cat and bound into the forest. This baby gets better and better. And he describes it as the Wampus Cat, which is a completely unrelated separate legend. The Wampus Cat? Yes. So the story ends with, and the legend says that the Wampus Cat still stalks the forest. There are a lot of cats on Hedder's Island. Sure. The Wampus Cat could be its own episode. It comes from a lot of Native American lore and has absolutely nothing to do (laughs) with, (laughs) with witches or witch hunting. That's really funny. So... I'm not going to be nice to this one because I really like my legends to be built on a kernel of some sort of truth. I like to look back at shipbuilding logs and attempt to locate, like, did the ship existed? I like to look back through whatever records you can find from publications and try to find names that could be kind of like we did with the devil and Hezekiah Jones. Yeah, absolutely. That's sort of like checking the historical record to see where did this get its start? I don't know if I'd call myself a skeptic because I want to find pieces that the story is built on. So let's start with what does line up. There is a tree. You can see where it was hit by lightning, likely. And we'll look at pictures here in a second. It says C-O-R-A on the side of it. Seen it. Joe has seen it. He took pictures for us. I'm going to share screen here. 
So this is supposedly the tree. And this is like 1700, right? This is when the story supposedly takes place. Yeah. It is a lovely tree and it is very old looking. So there's the split. Is weird aura on that picture? I mean, it has nothing to do with the fact that the sun is facing my camera. And it has to do with the creepiness of the tree. You're doing spirit photos of trees. I'm in. I'm sold. So this is the split. You can make out where it says Cora here. Ooh. Oh, that looks really neat. Yeah, it's cool. That's there. So I will not dispute that those details exist. But here's where it doesn't line up. The story starts immediately on the wrong foot and states that the tree is deep in the virgin forest. It's not. You can look up the core tree on Google Maps. It's got a four out of five star rating. Great for kids, I think, is one of the comments. <laughs> it has leaves. Right. So it's, it's supposed especially to be- great for kids if they turn into cats and run away. So <laughs> like, let's suspend all disbelief and say that maybe the forest ran immediately up to the sand dunes. Or sure. you know, let's say that it's still not going to be deep in the forest. And she was allegedly dragged straight from the water and taken and tied to the tree. So that's kind of hinky. The sound isn't that far from there. And I will say that is probably one of the widest parts of the island. It's in part of what's called now Frisco woods. Mm-hmm. So it is considered the wooded area of the island. And, Do I think the story is real? No. But just to play devil's advocate, the perspective of those people, that is probably deep in the virgin woods for that island. Yeah, I am not necessarily here to be this story's defense attorney, but I do think it's worth considering the possibility that maybe the shoreline has moved because of erosion. We know that the barrier islands are slowly going away. Maybe their definition at that time of deep in the woods was very different from ours because it was a much less settled time. Getting far outside of civilization took going a lot less distance. I hear you. But this book was published in 1989 and the neighborhood where the tree exists began development in 1966. Uh, okay. It includes artificially dredged canals and... As the person first publishing this story, I feel like representing it as deep in the virgin woods as a thousand year old tree, because that's exactly what he does. He doesn't say it was deep in the forest or, you know, there's deep in the heart of the virgin forest on Hatteras Island, there stands a gigantic live oak, which botanists estimate must be a thousand years old. Okay, present tense is kind of killing my enthusiasm for the possibilities. As an author, I feel like he does himself a disservice there yeah. by making it again like you said, present tense. Yeah, he's so, got to gin it up a little, I guess. <laughs> Here's his picture. Oh, bless his heart. So the tree is described as being a thousand years old as an oak on a barrier island where hurricanes hit. So I was like, okay, well, let's look at the tree. It's what is known as a Quercus nigra or water oak, which has a lifespan of between 60 to 80 years. A hundred if conditions are perfect. And it's not what I would call gigantic. I would say it's a normal sized tree. Yeah. <laughs> It is big for headers because most trees don't last very long because the hurricanes take them out. Yeah. So there's no records of Eli Blood, the brig Susan G out of Massachusetts, Captain Tom Smith, nothing. There's no historical record for any of these people? No. And as we saw with the devil and Hezekiah Jones, I was able to go back into the 1700s and find actual records of people in a neighboring county. Yeah. Did you look in Massachusetts for Eli Blood? I looked everywhere for Eli Blood. We also think Eli Blood's a moniker, right? Like, we don't think that's his real name. I feel like it's got to be a working name. Like, Eli Blood is basically this guy's drag name. (laughs) (laughs) So... It tosses in a legend that's completely unrelated at the very end of the story, almost like a hook for the sequel, right? Yeah. It's mixing legends. It's very generous in its description of things. And again, it does feel a lot like the last shot of an episode of X-Files where they want to suggest that maybe you'll see this thing again. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it doesn't show up anywhere before this book. And I think it's because he made it up as he describes in the foreword. Oh. So this is his fifth book of Outer Banks legends, right? What's the name of that book again? This is called Blackbeard's Cup and the Stories of the Outer Banks. Gotcha. And in I the- forgot to mention earlier, by the way, that Dare County is notorious for Blackbeard. Oh, yeah, that's going to be a whole thing. That's a, that's a whole separate <laughs> thing. He talks about other legends are handed down through generations as fact. Some are pure fantasy. These are born out of long and gale-ridden winter nights where the Outer Banks were stormbound and offspring clamored for a story of long ago. The ancient Chinese had a saying of, it is written. <laughs> so he basically admits to making, <laughs> like... 
I, I think what he's saying is he didn't make it up. I think he's saying that these are stories that are highly unlikely to be accurate, that are just lore of the folk who were stuck without power, well, probably well before then, but stuck and just there's nothing to do because the storm's demolished the island. Yeah, I think he made it up. <laughs> I've got four of his five books, and they start with stories that very much have record prior to his writing about them. I feel and then, like his whole reference to there being a Chinese saying of it is written is a very highfalutin attempt at the same sort of thing that say certain national figures do when they would like to make a baseless assertion and so they preface it with people are saying <laughs> and then they say the thing because they technically are people. Yes. Um, so this is definitely a fun story to tell kids. Maybe not the pricking the fingers and frothing the blood and seeing Are Satan. Are you kidding? I think that's fantastic to tell kids. <laughs> <laughs> hey Maybe kids, was- buy my books. <laughs> so this was the last collection of original works that he did. He passed away the year after it was published. They've since done, they being his publisher has since done additional collections where they sort of cherry pick stories from across his catalog, which is cool. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that this guy put in the work to fill five books, but I'm calling total shenanigans on this one. <laughs> Are, if I remember correctly, you mentioned that you, and you might be about to get to this. And so I'll stop talking about it. If that is the case, you found other instances of people asserting having the same thing, right? Yeah. So this is a big problem that I have with coastal lore. You'll find the exact same stories up and down the Carolinas coasts. Like the Dram Tree, for example. There's an Outer Banks Dram Tree where sailors would place a bottle of rum inside the tree on their way in or out of port and Wilmington claims the exact same legend. Oh, okay. So like multiple towns. And this is because of the transient nature of sailors, right? Mm -hmm. That's not the case with this story. All roads just go back to this book. I was hoping that I could build a case that maybe this is something where there is a kernel of truth to it somewhere, but the details have been changed over time, in part because of the transience of the people telling the stories. And so, you know, what if it really is based on something that actually happened in terms of someone accused of witchcraft and then she makes a a tidy escape? But that doesn't even line up with the era of what was happening on that island at the time. The big witch craze was more of a northeastern thing that didn't really come into the southern colonies quite as much. In fact, the opposite is true, where you look at traditions that we've talked about out of South Carolina, North Carolina as well, where different types of root magic and what we would call witchcraft were happening and accepted. Yeah, absolutely. There are countless stories from the place where I grew up in the Appalachians of, you know, the aunt. And by aunt, I mean directly a relative of mine who was the local witch woman for the town, basically. And ultimately, a lot of these people were the people with herb knowledge. (laughs) But by the same token, like my father went to a witch to have a medical condition cured when he was 12. That was in the 40s. Right. So I, I do feel like if you have an understanding of the historical reference points of the witch craze that undercuts this story too the only thing i would say contrary to that is hatteras is an island that's accessible by a bridge now since the 50s 60s or something like that when they put the bridge in prior to that it was boat only Mm -hmm. so especially without internet and things of that nature (laughs) stories would take a much longer time to travel to and from hatteras what year was the witch craze in massachusetts that was what the 1700s yeah so that could take years to to make its way down as like any sort of news because the only people coming and going were sailors for the most part. I feel like the witch trials in Massachusetts were maybe late 16th, early 17th century. They were 1692 to 1693. Yeah. So, so okay. So late 17th century. So 1700-ish is when the story is. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, I could see it taking that long to get down there as actual. Well, that um, I think that's why they make sure in the story that Eli Blood is from Massachusetts. Yeah, absolutely. And the whole bit with touching a cow and it stops giving milk that's straight out of massachusetts witch craze did they have uh, cows on hatteras island yeah. <laughs> that's a very good question i feel like this all adds up to a big cautionary tale it did kind of like a cultural meme of the time <laughs> right. like let's say that this happened because we would like for it not to happen here again Great story to tell the kids while you're on vacation and and go, ah, look at the tree. But the fact that a homeowner's association for the neighborhood that it's in has a whole thing posted about it 
tells me that it might have even been concocted based on the age of the tree as a marketing ploy. <laughs> wow. That had not occurred to me, but I like, like that a lot. Hey, check out the Brigands Bay Homeowners Association. We got a witch tree. And this dude that wrote the book was like unofficial mayor of the Outer Banks. Like people loved this guy. He was some sort of high ranking judge and lifetime lawyer very prominent figure in the Carolinas during his time on this earth. So somebody would have been like, hey, Chuckles, check this out. <laughs> Why don't you make a story about that? And be like, that's a good idea. Yeah, there, like that. There is a tree. It says Cora. Also, the name Cora, especially spelled with a C, couldn't really find any records of that name in general. That name got very popular after Last of the Mohicans was written. Oh, interesting. But prior to that, it wasn't like a super popular name. There's a German derivative spelled with a K. Anyway, point is, Shuckles Webby made it up. It's a good story to tell the kids. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. So Joe, when you yeah. were there, yep. how high up on the tree was the word Cora? Chest height, maybe eyeball height. I mean, not very high. Okay. So clearly not a tree that has been getting taller for 300 years. No. Yeah. So I just looked up the angel oak, which is a live oak tree in the Charleston area. I don't know if you guys have ever been down there and seen that tree. It is a monstrous tree. And that tree happens to be 400 to 500 years old. And it wow. is a monstrous tree. What type of oak is it? It is a southern live oak, a Quercus virginia. Yeah, see, it's a different variety. True. But still, that's one of the largest trees, oldest trees ever to still be in existence. And Charleston certainly gets its fair share of hurricanes, but not like Harris. So yeah. that was my, my first impression of the story was, that's a cool story. How is that tree still there? Yeah. Maybe she cursed it and it won't grow and it won't break and it won't bend and it just stays. Oh, I like that explanation a lot. I love the explanation that the story is true, but having her tied to it has now stunted the tree permanently. It's now preserved sort of like an insect in amber. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that a lot. Let's start that rumor. Yeah. yeah. Another um, question I have is like, do other people go there and carve their name into it? Surprisingly not. Okay. And it, I will say this, I've been going to Hatteras since I was a kid. I've probably driven by this tree 50 times. Never paid any attention to it. It's not marked. It's not like a big thing. There's a GPS marker. That's the only reason I found it. And I drove by it the first time and I went, wait, that tree, it's not that big. I turned back around, I pulled off. It's like a little, the road comes in and there's like a little median and the tree's in the median kind of goes around both sides. So I just pulled off in the grass and it took me a couple minutes of looking and I found Cora. And there were a couple other people stopping as well in COVID world with nothing else to do there. If you're tired of the beach or you're sunburned, you're probably just driving around looking at sites. Yeah. Looking at trees. Oh, that's fascinating. I also wonder what are the next door threads like for that neighborhood association about whose turn is it to, you know, mow around the Cora tree, et cetera. No, I refuse to mow around the cursed tree. Mm -hmm. Get over yeah. yourself, Kathy, mow around the cursed tree, et cetera. If it's anything like next door in my neighborhood, then that's what it's like. <laughs> Wampus cat uh, scene. Can somebody please come get it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I mowed the tree, my blade stopped. <laughs> <laughs> So that was a fun one, though, Joe, and I really appreciate you bringing it to us because we haven't really attacked a topic like this. You know, generally, we start off with a, ooh, that's a neat story. Let's do what we can to find what's real about it. And in this case, it was like a bad box of strawberries where you're like, oh, that one's bad, but that's okay. Underneath of it, if I just get the next one, the next one will be mm -hmm. okay. Nope, nope, nope. Nope. And it was like, okay, strawberries are a terrible analogy. <laughs> I'm hungry. I, I just had to chuck some strawberries that had uh, gone off. That's why I'm thinking about it. But mm. the point is, every thread we pulled out was just, just came right out while researching it. And I was just like, oh, man. It's like the bag of lettuce. It looks all fresh on the first layer. And as soon as you open it up, you've got like, you yeah. lettuce. everything else is mush. Welcome to Produce <laughs> Talk. <laughs> <laughs> the weekly podcast referencing produce and frustrations <laughs> in purchase. For all your fruits and vegetable needs. I do think that stories like this have value, though, and I think it's worth keeping them around and retelling them because they serve some important cultural purposes. Mm -hmm. They're a good way to encode things that we consider important to remember about our own history. And there are some important lessons in this one about prejudice and about outsiders meddling in your business and <laughs> you know, all kinds of things. It is possible that I read this story opposite of how it's supposed to be read, but I also know that I'm right, so whatever. Uh <laughs> And so, hum and so humble, too. <laughs> you know it, obviously. <laughs>
I told you the writer me is different. <laughs> <laughs> they encode a lot of things that it's important for us to remember. And they tell us about our history and they're an important way to tie significance to local places and to give people a sense of what is around us has been around us for a long time. And so maybe around us and the people who come after us for a long time from now and what we do may be remembered in the same way that we try to remember what was done. Mm-hmm. And I feel like those are all important lessons for people to learn. And those are really good things for us to use storytelling to try to keep alive. Yeah. I'm just happy that we added to it and made up a new detail. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Curse the tree. So as part of our October Blitz, we're doing extra episodes. We've got guests this month. It's really exciting. Uh, we're having a giveaway where if you post on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and use the hashtag Arcane Carolinas, you are automatically entered into a drawing to win some swag from our web store at arcanecarolinas.com. We've got pint glasses, we've got stickers, we've got koozies, we've got shirts, and we want to give them out, a few of them. So so use the hashtag Arcane Carolinas and we'll do our best to get you some of that. We have a new sticker for October as well. Rockin'. Thanks for I'm having me on. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, thanks yeah. for being here, Joe. It's so lovely to meet you. Yeah, likewise. And, uh, if anybody needs me, I'm going to be gathering sailors together and pricking their fingers. You've been listening to Arcane Carolinas. Thanks for joining us. If you liked it, give us a rating. Leave a comment. If you didn't like it, send us an email and tell us why. If you're not wrong, we'll try to fix it. And if you're interested in award-winning speculative fiction, including science fiction, urban fantasy, and horror, find me, Michael G. Williams, at www.michaelgwilliamsbooks.com and check out Falstaff Books at falstaffbooks.com. If you'd like to pick up some Arcane Carolinas merch, look at behind-the-scenes info, pictures videos, stuff like that, all the things that get cut, check out arcanecarolinas.com where you can get access to our Patreon, our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram, all that in one place, including the merch store. Buy a shirt. Clothe your body. Drape your body in our wares. Be our living billboards. (laughs) 